Hello. As any of my friends will tell you, for the last decade, Pico Iyer has been the name I most love to drop. So first, I'd like to thank the UCSB Arts and Lecture staff for providing me an opportunity to expand this activity to a much, much wider audience. <laughs> Probably every community in the world has a well-liked, vagrant soul, a happily homeless person in their midst. In Santa Barbara, a city of grandeur and almost ridiculous aesthetic spectacle, however, <laughs> We are fortunate to lay claim to Pico Iyer, a homeless person known and loved virtually everywhere in the reading world. For Pico, whose parents hail from India and whose education was split between stiff-necked England and loose-limbed California, this rootlessness became an inevitable state, however, a birthright of the contemporary world citizen. He thus begins his latest book with a quote from Nietzsche, Philosophy is really homesickness, old Frederick said, the wish to be everywhere at home. Of course, Pico is not truly homeless, as in destitute. If anything, perhaps, he suffers a surfeit of homes. Kyoto, Santa Barbara, England, a little monastery in Northern California, not to mention, as he does in the global soul, most of the world's major airports. <laughs> everywhere a home all of which he manages to locate and convey feelingly for us in the precise and elegant prose. In many books like Video Night and Kathmandu, The Lady and the Monk and Falling Off the Map, Pico makes this internationalism personal. He seems at once to explicate the condition and embody it. But that's not all. In other works like Tropical Classical and in his novel Cuba in the Night, Iyer takes us out farther. Pico has famously weighed in on topics diverse as the globe he trots, Henry Miller, upwardly mobile Marxists, Toronto's paradise versus Atlanta's inferno, the literary blurb, the lowly comma, and the strength of silence. But for me, the decisive factor, which has always led to this luxuriant name dropping, has been Pico himself. Through him, the man named by the Etnia reader is one of the 50 coolest people alive. For over a decade now, I've traveled vicariously, hung out with the Dalai Lama, Boy George, Leonard Cohen, and Kazuo Ishiguro. With him, I've actually traveled some too. Saw Bruce Springsteen in the downtown Los Angeles post-uprising. Cheered Hideo Nomo pitching at Chavez Ravine while men hawked sushi in the stands and once ate Indonesian food in Soho, London, all Pico turf. The chimes of midnight are a bit too late for Pico, as many of his friends know, but we ate a lot of pizza, and I always got treated to sparkling, quotable conversation. As a matter of fact, just the other day, I was talking with my pal Pico Iyer, and he said an interesting thing. Describing his own work, he told me he thought it could be well understood as a cross between Jewel singing Ave Maria and the clash doing all lost in your supermarket. <laughs> Is it any wonder I drop his name? Ladies and gentlemen, Santa Barbara's famous homeless son, Pico Iyer. Now you know why I drop DJ's name whenever I can. That was um, such a beautiful and gracious and thoughtful and rigorous introduction. I think you've summarized my writing and my work much better than I could. And actually, I wish you would just come up and talk for the next hour in, instead of me. But uh, as all of you know, I mean, DJ Palladino has been the great custodian and champion of all the Santa Barbara arts for years and years, painting, books, theater, TV, films, you name it. But most of all, um, has been such a, a generous, spirited, kind-souled friend. Um, so take that introduction divide by about 15, subtract 40, and you'll be close to the truth. But I'm very glad if Santa Barbara does claim me as a son, because uh, I'll gladly drop Santa Barbara's name, too. Um, and I'm stunned uh, that so many people are here. I think maybe you're expecting to hear Jane Smiley, but uh, <laughs> sad to say you're 48 hours early. Uh, and delighted to be here, too, uh, because this is literally sacred space for me. I think I probably saw every film nominated for the Academy Award for Best Foreign Motion Picture between the years of 1985 and 1991 in this very space. Um, and I'm also really, really happy to be 
part of the Arts and Lecture series, not just because uh, I'm next to Angie Min and Jane Smiley, closest I'll ever come to a Pulitzer Prize, uh, and not just because I'm in the same brochure as uh, Philip Glass and uh, John Cleese, uh, but because, as probably most of you know, as a terminally professionally homeless son of Santa Barbara, I pretty much have got my whole, um, I feel I've got my entire informal, invisible education at UCSB. Uh, I'm lucky enough to have parents who've taught here uh, on and off for 35 years. And so really every book I've ever read, I read on the eighth floor of the UCSB library. Most of the interesting people and performers I've heard were at Campbell Hall. Usually Roman would be able to slip me in as he slipped me in into this schedule. Uh, and really um, Santa Barbara is where I learned much more than at the places where I was ostensibly learning about the world. Um, I actually wish I were here 18 months from now because I'm just completing a book uh, that I think, I hope, is saturated with the sounds and smells and feelings of Santa Barbara. The main character lives on Del Playa. Uh, important scenes take place at pivotal locations like Chaucer's, Follow Your Heart on Milpas. Uh, quite a lot of the action takes place within a two block range of where we're sitting now. Uh, one of the other characters lives on Valerio Street, three blocks away. And so, if nothing else, you wouldn't recognize the people in the book, but you might recognize the places. Um, so. I wish I were reading that. Unfortunately, I haven't quite finished it yet. So uh, I'm left with the extremely hapless task of talking about this really dour and impenetrable book, the last one I wrote, called The Global Soul, which is so difficult to get through, I don't even recommend my friends read it. Um, <laughs> really, I would say if you're tempted to buy a copy, wait till the Santa Barbara book next year. It's similar, similar themes, but a much fresher setting. Uh, but like it or not, I'm duty-bound uh, to read from and discuss this book. And uh, I don't know about you, but I find whenever I attend readings, I'm always sort of tapping my fingers and twiddling my toes or vice versa, waiting in some ways for the person to finish reading. That's to say, waiting for him to look up from the book or look up from the text and make some kind of contact and create a bridge between up here and down there. So assuming that at least a few of you are similarly afflicted, uh, I thought I would just um, begin with a short reading of about 10 or 12 minutes then try to justify uh, to myself and to you why I read it and um, <laughs> to explain at formidable length uh, what this book is meant to be about and some of the themes that I've been thinking about in, in recent years uh, and then just have a couple more short readings and then get to what for me is always uh, the most interesting and important part of these evenings which is question and answer and a chance for you uh, to get back at me, <laughs> whatever that means, but uh, certainly to correct or criticize uh, or, or question me. Uh, but I will start with a reading from this book, as mentioned, uh, and I think almost every other time I've given a reading, I always like to start uh, with a comical, or at least ostensibly comical, passage, just to put everyone in a good mood and uh, assuage the pain that follows. Uh, in this case, I've been through this book again and again and again. I can't find a single funny passage. Uh, really, if you read it, you'll suffer through the reality of that. Uh, it, it's the most humorless book I've ever read, I think. Uh, and so, with that in mind, and in despair on many fronts, uh, I, th I thought that I would just read uh, the opening pages, because they're set in Santa Barbara. Many of you will recognize the, uh, the scenes and, um, and certainly the events. And then, as I say, I'll try and explain uh, why I read this. <laughs> Suddenly, the flames were curling 70 feet above my living room, whipped on by 70 mile per hour winds that sent them ripping across the dry brush like maddened horses. I tried to call the fire department. There they are, on cue. <laughs> Cost a lot to set that up, but you know, <laughs> seemed the least I could do for a hometown audience. <clears throat> I tried to call the fire department, but the phone was dead. I tried to turn the lights on, but the electricity was gone. I went upstairs again to see that the flames, which minutes before had been a distant knife of orange cutting through a hillside, were now all around me. The view through the picture windows, a wall of flames. I picked up my mother's cat and ran out of the house with two friends who had just arrived to try to be of help. But there was nowhere for us to go. At our feet, a precipitous slope that fell towards the road. On every other side, fires that were rising to a crest. We jumped into a car and drove down the orange-licked driveway to the narrow mountain road and saw that we couldn't go up, we couldn't go down. Bushes were bundles of orange and flames were leaping over the slope beside us like dogs jumping at a fence. 
The way down led to a blaze of burning. The way up led into the conflagration. Beside us on the road was one other vehicle, a water truck driven up by a good Samaritan who found himself now as trapped as we were and stood alone in the road in his shorts, extending a forlorn hose towards the fire. Already the smoke was so thick we could not even see the helicopters above as we sat in an angry orange haze, listening to their blades. One friend and our new companion stood in the road and pointed the water at every new roar of fire that flamed over the ridge. I had never known that fire moved so fast, so purposefully. We could see it cutting through the slope across from us as if with a letter opener and scrambling up my driveway as if summoned to an execution. We sat in the car, the cat coughing in my lap, and for two hours saw and felt nothing but flames and more flames. After night fell, at last a fire truck came up and led us back to a safer spot a little down the mountain, from which, as an opera played on the radio, I saw the fire up above lick at my room, reduce the second floor to a skeleton, charge down towards the city below. Along the road, a horse was running madly. A man caked in soot appeared, not knowing where he was going. Below, we could see cars burning placidly by the side of the road. At last, after another hour, the fire having already shot into the suburbs below and leaping the eight lanes of the freeway which leads all the way to Canada, we were free to drive down through a wasted world of steaming cars and ravaged houses, the black hills all around wearing necklaces of orange. I got taken to a friend's house, went across to an all-night supermarket to buy a toothbrush and started my knife anew. The next day, in the early morning, I returned to the road along which I'd been driving for all my adult life and found it blocked off, exhausted firemen sitting on the pavement at the foot of the mountains, bowing their heads or gulping from bottles of water. I was allowed to climb it as a resident, the fire having retreated back into the hills. And so for the first time in 25 years, I walked all the way up the road, past houses reduced to chimneys or just outlines of themselves, past occasional houses, just as randomly, entirely intact. Here and there, wisps of smoke still trickled up through the asphalt, and beside the hulks of cars along the road, the aluminum from their hubcaps had made little pools of silver. When I arrived at my house, high up on a ridge, two-thirds of the way up the mountain, it was to find a smoking ash-gray sea. Bronze statues had been reduced to nothing. Filing cabinets were husks. All the props of my parents' 60 years, all the notes and prospects I'd been collecting for 15 years, all the photographs, memories, all the past, gone. I'd often referred to myself as homeless, an Indian born in England and moving to California as a boy, with no real base of operations or property even in my 30s. I'd spent much of the previous year among the wooden houses of Japan, reading the burning house poems of Buddhist monks and musing on the value of living without possessions and a home. But now, all the handy metaphors were actual. And the lines of the poems included in the manuscript that was the only thing in my shoulder blag when I fled were my only real foundations for a new fin de siècle life. A little later, California being what it is, a society built on quicksand where everyone is getting new lives every day, just as the final touches were being applied to a new house on the lonely ridge, an earthquake shook its foundations, and all our neighborhood trembled. Then, a few months later, as finally we moved back into our old address and days after an earthquake shook my other adopted home in western Japan, suddenly huge rains came down and sent whole parts of the slope underneath the house sliding towards the city below. I, alone and lost at writing at my desk, and used besides to mudslides that regularly washed away parts of the road, got ready early and for almost the only time that year put on my one semi-respectable set of clothes blue jacket, grey trousers, white shirt and tie. I had to speak to a women's club a hundred miles away in Los Angeles. As I began driving down the road, I found huge branches, large parts of trees blocking the way. Boulders stood in the middle of driveways and overhead ominously I could hear the whir of helicopters. But such disruptions are not uncommon in the California winter, and so I drove on, swerving past rocks and edging past the debris, until within a hundred yards of leaving my house, I accelerated past a piece of the road that was just dirt and scrabble, tried to speed through a long puddle, and found myself buried, three feet deep in a muddy river. I had no choice but to get out, of course, and as soon as I did, I was heart high in mud. 
My clothes were waterlogged, my shoes were thick with gunk, and my broken umbrella seemed only to protect the elements from me. Thus encumbered, I began slipping and falling and rappling my way towards the nearest house on the desolate mountain. Below me, I could see the red roof and Spanish-style white walls of the only house that had survived the fire. And so my umbrella bouncing against me in the wind, my trousers soggy and thick with mud, half sliding down a brown liquid slope, I'd made my way through groves of avocado trees to the distant place of calm. When I got to the landscape driveway, it was to find it empty in the rain, all its gates closed, no answer to my bell. A security system winked above the door to remind me that I was an intruder, a postmodern neighbor, that is, who'd never even been to this house maybe five minutes for my own. And I recalled that my only hope lay further down through another ravaged orchard where I could see some distant figures moving. I began slipping, shoes all brown and legs stiff with mud. My umbrella extended like some contraption ready to take off in the wrong direction, down the squishy slope, over fallen branches and tangled up in trees, reckless now and hardly caring what got torn, until I came to a small white trailer, sitting precariously in the shadow of a slope that looked ready to collapse. The owners of the house were far away, I heard, in Puerto Vallarta for all I knew, their full-time laborers now were trying to carry their few possessions out of the two-room trailer before the hillside crashed down upon them. My neighbors, unmet for more than 20 years, I hadn't even known of their existence here or of this temporary home, welcomed me into their room and handed me a cell phone with which to call the women's club. The lines were all cut, though. 14 inches of rain had fallen in less than a day in this arid subtropical town, and so there was nothing to do but sit there and catch my breath for a moment as the men in sturdy galoshes and thick sweaters went uncomplainingly about their evacuation. There were a couple of mattresses on the floor, an empty can of Uban coffee, a couple of tapes of John Sebastian singing Spanish songs. A crucifix hung on a wall. A Mexican movie star smiled back from a frame. A comic book told the story of Estefania, defensor de los indios. He'd lived here, the man who made me feel at home, told me, for 28 years now, more than half his life, I figured, here being Texas and Arizona and all kinds of other places from which he was able to visit Mexico for two weeks every year. His eyes lit up when he spoke of our Mexico, of the village rituals of his place, of the beauty of Guadalajara, of the international airport not far from where he owned 80 acres in Aguas Calientes. Here, of course, he had next to nothing except neighbors he'd never met and a trailer that looked precarious. You must miss your country, your family. It's sad. We heard shouts, excited cries as the boys finished loading up the truck and began making plans for walking into town to party. At night, I got this, he said, pulling out a brand new copy of the 1995 World Almanac in Spanish, though this was only the 10th day of January, 1995. You don't have a television? We do, but it's broken, two months already. I don't like to watch the television. The man did want to be an American, though. I had an interview last September, he said, the two of us shivering a little in the chill, dark stables. September 14th, but I missed it. Outside, the sky had begun to clear a little, and I'd grown almost used to looking like some member of an Amazon tribe whose notion of dressing up was putting on coat and tie and smearing himself in mud. <laughs> the young workers, bearing spades, suddenly began walking off into the rain, tramping up the tree-crushed slopes, and the man smiled out at them. Every night they go to town, even walk. It's only three miles to the supermarket. Below us, though we couldn't know it yet, waters 14 feet high were actually burying underpasses and kids were surfing on the transcontinental highway. The heaviest rains in 500 years, people were saying, assuming the Chumash and early Spaniards kept records of these things. But my host was still anxious to make me feel welcome and he asked me about India, about whether it was in Europe, about whether there were many poor people there. He shook his head when I said it took 24 hours to fly there and told me that his nephew-in-law, the boy on his way to town now, was on his way to Baltimore. America must be hard. He shrugged. They didn't get much money, but they could get a big meal for $1.50. They had security. After you'd been working five years in this place, you could take a three-week vacation. Life wasn't so bad. They just needed papers. We looked out through the sludge and drizzle to a nearby house we built since the fire. Is a Spanish word, he said, a little proudly, holding it gently on his tongue, adobe. 
When I decided the storm had broken enough for me to clump back up to my house, my clothes so caked in filth that I ended up stripping naked at my front door and leaving all the sodden clothes outside, I turned to my new friend and said, Que lastima. He waved and smiled. It's a nice word. It is a classic story in its way of fire and flood and migration. The two moments I've just described could almost come from some Old Testament parable. The words themselves of exile and homelessness and travel are old ones that speak to something intrinsic in the state of being human. But it's a modern story, too, of a person with an American alien card and an Indian face and an English accent on his way to Japan, meeting a neighbor who lives down the street in a universe that has never touched his own. And a man coming to a country where he can scarcely speak the language and passing 28 years as an illegal to support a family he scarcely sees. Two kinds of cross-border experience meet, one postmodern and fueled by technology, the other tribal almost, over the Atlantic and under the border fence. The other truth is that they're crossing all the time these days, the new and the old, and producing encounters seldom seen before. Two different worlds are coming together now, and both of us aliens and unofficials for 28 years in the great immigrants' land of promise were being tossed about in the fast driving winds that were blowing the world all around. Well, as I hope is obvious, or at least, thank you. <clears throat> I hope you can all hear me and you're not getting an echo or anything. Is it okay? Fine. Um, well, I hope, as is obvious uh, from, from that piece, or certainly implicit, the reason I re read it is not because it's such a remarkable thing to lose one's house in a fire. It happens to hundreds of thousands of people every year in California, and I think anyone who lives in the hills uh, anywhere in California knows that fire in some ways is one's most loyal neighbor. Fire is the one force that can be relied upon, and everyone half expects to be burned out of their house. I read it more uh, because to me it speaks metaphorically for what is the state of more and more people in our ever-spinning globe, which is to say ha that they have the foundations on which they've based their lives raised to the ground in some ways. And they have to construct their sense of house, their sense of home in a way that's utterly unrelated to the house. Uh, the day after the fire, when I was staying just one and a half blocks away from here on Chapala Street, and literally all I had was a toothbrush, I had very forcibly to remind myself that home is something portable and invisible. Home is something you carry around with you in the values and attachments and values uh, and friendships that you take with you everywhere you go. Home is less and less about a piece of territory or a piece of soil and more and more to do with something internal. And also to me it speaks for the sense that more and more people are in some ways constructing their lives on the ash heap uh, of the old certainties. I'm sure a lot of you in this room read Salman Rushdie's last book, The Ground Beneath Her Feet, and if you did, you'll remember that he uses earthquake as his defining metaphor. I use fire, but in some ways it comes to the same thing, and when Rushdie writes about earthquakes, he's doing so as a way to suggest that the very tectonic plates of human life are being stretched and pulled and taken into new directions, and that humans, in some fundamental way, are living as humans have never done before. It's also, of course, a sobering reminder that just, I think, as technology encourages us to believe that we have everything under our control, acts of God or acts of nature or acts of whatever is greater than us remind us that we're very much hostage to whatever is beyond us. Uh, and so I began thinking and, and trying to formulate some ideas about a new kind of international person that I call a global soul. And a global soul, I would say, is somebody who lives in the cracks between cultures, in the spaces between categories, in passageways almost. A person who has to construct his or her sense of tradition and community and home and even self from scratch. Uh, I often think in this context of my grandparents, all four of whom were, built, uh, were born <laughs> and built uh, not so very long ago in India. And I think for all four of them, when they were born, they had a very strong, perhaps oppressively strong sense of what they believed and where they belonged, who their friends were, who their enemies were, what tradition they were a part of. And they expected and were justified in the expectation that they would pass their whole lives within a very close vicinity of the places where they were born. And now in just two generations, more and more people are scattered 
scattered across the globe in all kinds of ways, which is, I think is a great liberation and an opportunity, but like any opportunity, comes with a challenge and in some ways asks questions of us in terms of defining identity for which not everybody has an answer and somebody who don't has, doesn't have an answer is liable uh, to, to fall between the cracks. So my sense was that what used to be a given in even our grandparents' generation is now a chosen, that inheritance is less and less important. Uh, and as you can tell already, uh, I got my, some sense of how a global soul might function from the closest example to hand, uh, which was me. Um, as, as you heard, uh, I was born of Indian parents in England. Um, we moved to Santa Barbara when I was seven. And so literally, by the time I was in the third grade, the simplest questions brought very complicated answers. If somebody said to me, where do you come from? Um, I'd say everywhere, or I'd say nowhere. If I actually tried to give a precise answer, the answer would go on so long, they'd roll their eyes and go out of the room before I'd finished. Uh, I, I didn't feel that I could call myself an Indian because uh, I've never lived in India and I don't speak a word of any of its more than 200 languages. I certainly didn't look like anyone's idea of a traditional Englishman. Uh, and if I were tempted to call myself an American, I only had to pick out my green card and see where it said permanent alien to be reminded otherwise. <laughs> Uh, and I must say, when I was growing up, um, I always felt that this was a relatively rare and a deeply privileged position to be in, to have access to many, so many cultures, to have one foot inside so many places and yet not to be beholden to any one of them. And I thought, you know, what an advantage that in some ways I can choose my home where previous generations would have had the home in, foisted on them, whether they liked it or not. But nowadays, when I go around the major cities of the world, whether it's Los Angeles or New York or Sydney, Toronto, Hong Kong, more and more places, half the kids I see are ten times more international than I am. I suspect half the kids in this room, if they're in their 20s, have a much more interesting and, and Mongol background. And my sense is that these global souls, as I call them, though constituting still a very small number, are growing very quickly. And every time, for example, a German goes to Thailand and meets and falls in love with a Thai woman and brings her back to Los Angeles, the little girl who rises out of that union is not German and not Thai and not strictly American, and she's a whole new culture and um, can produce forms of creativity and can respond to a world, the world in a way we've never seen before. I have a little friend uh, aged about nine now in Los Angeles who rejoices in the name of Pilar Asako Garcia Brown. Literally every one of her names comes from a different continent and that seems to me the distinguishing mark of the 21st century. So when I began thinking about these global souls, I put them essentially in three categories. The first are the people who are living in passageways, who are picking and choosing between identities and uh, who are having to construct themselves in ways that very few people ever did before. Uh, the second would be people who are very rooted in their background, but just by the nature of things in our new global world, find themselves flying across the world just to sign a contract or just to visit their parents or just to take a vacation with their kids. Uh, what's striking to me is just, just in the last 30 years, principally because of jet travel, people are living in ways that were inconceivable to humans before. Literally, uh, more and more people wake up in the tropics and have lunch the same day in a snowstorm, wake up uh, in the 21st century and go to sleep that night in the 30s century, travel across five continents in an afternoon. And I think we begin to think about the physiological effects of all this movement, but haven't really addressed the psychological or spiritual or emotional effects of, of people living in so many places all at once. And the third category of global souls, conveniently enough, is just about everyone. Uh, because my sense is that it's not just people who are moving around the world, but it's the world that's moving around us more and more quickly. And so even somebody who never leaves her hometown suddenly is surrounded by the four corners of the world. Some uh, young woman from Los Angeles, say, who's born and raised in her grandmother's house, when she walks out of that house and walks down the street to the corner market, is surrounded by signs in Hangul and people speaking Chinese and the customs and rights of Guatemala and El Salvador. Salvador, and suddenly places that in her grandmother's day would have seemed like the furthest corners of the universe, other planets almost, a part of her life. And so this book is a way of saying that to me, the fundamental question of the moment, and certainly ever more of the moments to come, is how do we orient ourselves in a world full of strangeness? How do we make our peace in a community where everyone is speaking different languages? My feeling is that never before in human history have so many people been so surrounded by so much that's alien to them, and so it becomes the imperative
imperative for all of us to try to come to some kind of accommodation with that, and better than that, to try to make out of it uh, new combinations that can take us to places we've, we've never been before. And when I use this word global soul, I partly do that um, as a way to try to rescue or hijack the word global from global markets and global networks. I think nearly always when we hear this buzzword that's become so amazingly fashionable the last five years, uh, it's either referring to the new splendors of um, the multinational company or to the new wonders of, of computer technology. But in some ways, what we think of as global is nearly always, as I see it, very soulless. It's, um, it's Planet Reebok, it's Nike, it's McDonald's, it's Starbucks, it's all the things that are more and more taking shape in every corner of the world, but seem to steady us and sustain us only at the most superficial level and not to answer any of the, the, the needs and questions we may have deeper than that. And so uh, talking about a global soul is a way to try to ask how we may take the, the cool word global and attach it to conscience or ask what global loyalty may be or ask uh, what a global heart could be. And the reason, as I'm sure you can gather at this point, why I read that second section about my unmet neighbor down the road uh, is to bear, bring home what luckily has become more and more a public issue in the last few years, which is that this internationalism that I'm describing is taking place on two levels all at once. There are people like me and probably like most of you in this room who can enjoy these possibilities that were inconceivable not so long ago and uh, in some ways are the privileged and comfortable inheritance of a new global possibility. But at the same time, there are more and more people propelled out of their houses in all the age-old ancestral biblical ways by famine, poverty, and war. So that my, my neighbor, whom I'd never met in all those years, literally is living 28 years in a country where he can't speak the language and where he's not even a legit legitimate citizen in order to support a family in the neighboring country whom he scarcely ever sees. And when I began my journey and, and thinking about some of these themes, I found out, as I'd never known before, that the number of refugees in the world has actually gone, gone up tenfold just since I was in high school. Uh, there are, if you include unofficial refugees, there are now 100 million in the world, which means if you take the population of Canada and of Australia and take the population of Canada again and take the population of Australia again, you still have fewer people than are displaced uh, in the most aching and plangent ways and have to address some of these issues um, with much more anguish than the likes of you and certainly of, of me. Uh, as many of you probably know, but I didn't until a couple of years ago, the UN High Commission for Refugees, uh, which was set up in 1951 as a temporary agency for one year just to deal with the chaos that resulted at the end of World War II, has had its one-year mandate uh, renewed and renewed and renewed to the point where it just um, celebrated, if that's a word, its 51st anniversary, uh, and in fact is dealing with um, probably 20 times as many refugees as, uh, as in 1951. Uh, and as all of you know, in some ways this globalism is taking place on two planes all at once, but the distance between them seems to be greater than it ever has been before. Uh, three American individuals famously have the same net worth as 48 nations of the world. Um, even within this country, which is relatively prosperous and uh, certainly egalitarian, Bill Gates alone is worth the same as a hundred million of us. And I find um, one reason that I travel is just to remind myself of the, of the ways in which most people in the world still live. Because I find when I'm in Santa Barbara, I'm often talking delightedly to my friends about the wonders of email or the possibilities of the internet. And it's very easy to forget that two-thirds of the people in the world have never even used a telephone. The internet is the last thing on their minds. And though they're understandably grateful for all the possibilities and facilities and the longer life and better education that the internet will certainly bring them in, in the future. For the time being, their concerns are the urgent age-old ones, just food and shelter and safety for their kids. And so I began to think that the, the more fortunate members of, of the homeless, as DJ said, the, the homeless people who don't really have to worry about uh, finding a home and for, for whom home is, is a, a notion that extends out and, and provides lots and lots of cho choices rather than too few, uh, those of us are sort of living in the equivalent of a plane, uh, six miles above the realities of the world, with everything brought to you in the comfort of your um, seat, uh, sort of exhilaratedly surrounded by strangers, beholden to the laws of no community, um, and in this dangerous place of all rights and no responsibilities. And I think even as ads and, and companies uh, to tell us that we live in a global marketplace tell us that the world is getting smaller, my own sense traveling around the world is, if anything, the world is getting 
bigger, partly because of the illusion of smallness and partly because the distances, economic and other, psychological, are greater than ever before between the few of us who live in the techno bubble and the few and the, the vast number who live as if um, the Bible was still the defining characteristic um, of their lives. And so, thinking about all this and thinking about these discrepancies, I came up, well, I first I came up with the idea of wandering around the world to see how this global lifestyle is taking shape, and then I came up with a much worse idea, which I don't recommend uh, any of you try and which I wish I hadn't come up with, um, which was to go and live in and around Los Angeles airport for a week or two, uh, <laughs> taking it as a model of the city of the future, not an inspiring model, but perhaps a realistic model. Uh, I'd noticed at some point that I literally spend 40 days a year, six whole weeks of every year, either in an airplane or in an airport, um, in these nowhere places, neither here nor there. And my friends who are in business regard me as a stay-at-home. They travel much, much more than I do. And so I realized more and more people are spending more and more time in these uh, anonymous spaces. Uh, and I also remembered that when I was growing up, uh, I always used to love going to the airport because that was the one place where you could see chadors and saris and galabeas and it was the only place in my life where I felt I could get a taste and, um, and a glimpse of all the cultures of the world and now of course on every other street corner in Vancouver or Paris or Melbourne or LA uh, you, can, you can see the rights of, um, of distant places and so it seemed to me that cities more and more are places where people congregate from all over the place, talk past one another, walk past one another Cities in some ways look like airports, more and more, and airports certainly look like cities. As you probably know, airports now very often have health clubs, porno cinemas, theatres, chapels, microbreweries, mini golf courses. Um, literally, no exaggeration, people live in airports. Um, Dallas-Fort Worth Airport alone is larger than the whole of Manhattan. And the the airport seemed to me a perfect metaphor for the place where the new international being lives. It's, it's a reality where he lives, but it's certainly a metaphor because it's literally neither here nor there. It's not home, but it's not really exotic. It's a kind of anonymous center for, for intimacy. And one of the fascinating things to me about airports is that you see the most private, urgent, emotional dramas of human life, the same things that humans have been doing for thousands and thousands of years people kissing and kissing, people sobbing, people breaking down, seeing loved ones they haven't seen for 20 years, saying goodbye to loved ones they're not sure they'll ever see again, going off on honeymoons, taking off for war. And you see all this, and yet what they're surrounded by is shopping malls and food courts and parking structures, the most anonymous things in the world. Um, the, the nature company, the body shop, the sharper image. I think the names themselves have this rather chill and generic sound. Uh, when I was growing up, not to be nostalgic, because it wasn't so wonderful then necessarily, but when I was growing up, shops were usually named after families. Now they often have that ominous word, the, uh, at, at the front of them. Uh, and the other reason that I chose Los Angeles Airport in particular was my sense that it's a kind of um, terminal of dreams. That's to say, more than any other airport I can think of in the world, it's a place to which people come low high with expectations. People have saved up money for 30 years. They've dreamed and dreamed of this magical place they see on their screens and see in movies. Um, they've risked imprisonment or worse, death, to come here. And they, they get on the plane, heavy with their expectations of the American dream. They land in LAX and come slap up against the, the force of American reality. Uh, so that uh, uh, Tibetan, to take an example, who's escaping what he sees as the oppression of the Chinese government, may steal through the Himalayas, go to Delhi, fly through the night and the day and the night, step out into Los Angeles airport, get out into the international arrivals hall, and half the faces he sees are Chinese. He'll, he'll be sensitive to know enough to know that these individuals have nothing to do with the government he thought was oppressing him, but at the same time he, he learns very quickly that the reality is much more complicated and often much different than he'd expected when he was sitting at home dreaming uh, of this promised place. Uh, and so I, I thought an airport was a way for seeing how the changeless part of humanity comes in collision with the 21st century part of humanity. And as you can also probably begin to tell, one reason I was drawn to the airport was just um, my own personal experience again. Uh, my family, as I said, came here when I was eight years old. 
And actually in those days, as those of you who read DJ's all too flattering piece in The Independent this week know, uh, in those days we worked out it was actually cheaper for me to fly back to the school where I'd been having my education in England and fly back to California three times a year on vacation than to go to the local private school here in Santa Barbara. So literally from the time I was nine years old, uh, my school bus was a jumbo jet, uh, or an air bus it should have been. I went to school by plane. Uh, and I can remember very, very vividly this sensation. This was California in the 60s, of course, so Jerry Garcia was in the air, black light posters were everywhere you turned, kids were, you know, remaking the world as we saw it and burning down the Bank of America building in IV. And I'd get in the car, I'd drive to LAX, I'd get on a plane, I'd fly, fly for 10 hours over the pole, and I'd arrive basically in the year 1441. Um, <laughs> which should be an exaggeration but isn't because uh, I went to a school where literally we had to wear full morning dress every day to class where we sang hymns in Latin on Sundays uh, and where nothing had really changed since it had been founded in 1441. And I thought that kids always go through a fairly abrupt transition. They're always one person when they say goodbye to their parents and another person when they say hello um, to their friends at school. But until 10 years before that, no kid had been able to fly 6,000 miles in, in, in 10 hours. And I thought it was a relatively new sensation to be able literally to fly between 1441 and 1968 in so fast a time. Uh, and for 1968 and 1441, not neither of them really to be the place where you belong necessarily. And like any um, shrewd and canny kid, I also learned very quickly how to turn this to advantage. So of course, um, in, in those days, every little English boy only had one dream in life, and that was to be a Californian. Um, so I would play up my California residence to the hilt. As soon as I'd get back to 1441, I'd say, oh yeah, you know, I saw Grace Slick in the holidays, and I walked down Telegraph Avenue, and I knew every last thing that's going down with um, the Grateful Dead or whatever, and my friend Eyes would, get, eyes would grow as large as saucers. Uh, and then when I'd come back to Santa Barbara, I'd go to the uh, Fairview Drive-In, as it was then, and as often as not, there was a horror movie playing, and usually it was a Hammer horror film. Uh, and as the uh, vampire was descending upon the unsuspecting young woman, she would uh, repulse him by reciting the Lord's Prayer backwards in Latin. And I would stun my little nine-year-old friends by reciting the Lord's Prayer and backwards, backwards in Latin along with her. Um, they didn't know that if you go to school in England, or that kind of school, pretty much the only thing you learn is how to recite the Lord's Prayer backwards in Latin. Uh, and so my upbringing really gave me a crash course in, in what I've been writing about ever since, which is how cultures dream about one another and how they look for redemption to the far places of the world and how they misunderstand one another and how each person wants to be where the other person is to the point where when two cultures meet, as much as anything, it seems to me a dance of dreams that ensues and sometimes a dance of illusions and very often uh, a dance of misunderstandings. Uh, and the last thing I'll say about the airport uh, is that there's a lot in this book about jet lag because uh, jet lag seemed to be the, the physiological equivalent of an airport passageway. Again, it's not quite a drug state, it's not quite a dream state, but it's certainly a neither here nor there state. Um, and, and to me it's a foreign country, which, which sounds facetious, but until 40 years ago, no one had ever been in the state of jet lag. Now more and more people spend more and more of their time half dislocated, uh, and nobody really knows what's going on in, in, inside them. Uh, and I realized that when I, when I used to travel a lot to the remoter corners of the world, whether it was uh, North Korea or Paraguay or Bhutan, at some level I went there because they took me to foreign states inside myself. They took me to emotions and places inside me and corners of my um, subconscious that I would never visit in the comfort of Santa Barbara. And I realized that the impulse to travel was the impulse to move to a foreign state. And then I realized, well, you don't have to travel, you can just live semi-perpetually in jet lag and you're always in a foreign state. <laughs> Now, I suspect most of the people in this room spend all too much time, as I do, in LAX, and the last thing you want to do is spend any more time. But uh, when I was talking to Roman in preparing uh, for this evening, he said that he'd, he'd rather see more readings rather than fewer. So I will actually share with you a few, a few minutes about um, state of jet lag. Um, it's probably all too familiar. And this is from my week in LAX. <clears throat> And so, half inadvertently, not knowing whether I was facing east or west, not knowing whether it was night or day, I slipped into that peculiar state of mind, or no mind, that belongs to the no time, no place of the airport. That outer body state in which one's not quite there, but certainly not elsewhere. My words didn't quite connect, and the world came to me through panes of soundproof glass. I felt myself in a state of suspended animation, five miles above the sea. Sleepy, lightheaded, unsure of how much pressure to put on things. 
I had entered the stateless state of jet lag. By now, like more and more of us, I'm no stranger to those no man's land, a realm of spaced out dreaminess where something in one doesn't engage and something else comes loose. So one is left either skating giddily, heart wide open on the surface of oneself, or feeling mysteriously clogged somehow, heart high in mud. Every few weeks, quite often, I fly from Japan to California and find myself revved up, speedy, all adrenaline as I touch down, with my mind turned off and my defenses flung open. I write wildly emotional letters to people I've hardly met and get shaken and moved by every film I see, as if truly under some foreign influence, the wonder drug of displacement. On the way back, I end up at the other pole, reluctant for days to get out of bed with every book or thought I entertain seeming leaden. My words have not caught up with me. It's as if they're pieces of luggage that the airline has misplaced and sent on by a later flight. <laughs> and it's only slowly, day by day, that I come back into focus. Until at last, perhaps a week after I've returned, I wake up one morning at a normal hour and realize that I'm reassembled, intact, here. All this, of course, is nothing more than a matter of biorhythms and circadian rhythm upsets, as they say, and is only an accelerated, compacted form of that process whereby we feel differently and occupy different moods at eight in the morning and three in the afternoon. A morning person stays awake and throbs all night on jet lag, and doctors reassure us that moroseness and even cataracts and high-frequency hearing loss are to be expected from this constant crisscrossing of timelines. But what is interesting, in part because so new, are the less calculable effects of the modern world, or the ones it's still too early for scientists to gauge. Humanity today is facing all kinds of sudden jerks it's never known before, and many of us embrace this phenomenon, the very definition of possibility, without knowing what the consequences will be. The average person today sees as many images in a day as a Victorian might in a lifetime. But compounding and confusing this are the shifts in place and mind we experience that Sigmund Freud and Oscar Wilde could never have imagined. We wake up orphaned in West Hollywood and go to sleep surrounded by our parents in medieval Kathmandu. We zigzag across centuries as if they were just settlements in a village. As I wandered through the long gray terminals of LAX for day after day and through departure lounge after departure lounge, I realized how many of the people around me were sleepwalkers too on edge, wound up, trying to bring the twilight zone inside of them in sync with the hazy sunshine all around. I saw people opened up, pouring their life stories out to strangers, and other people making new life stories with the strangers they began embracing. I saw people reaching out to one another with the jangled camaraderie of survivors at sea. I saw people slip around disappointment and hide their relief behind strong makeup. People get ugly here, a woman who worked as a traveler's aid volunteer for 17 years told me. I no longer think of travel as very pleasurable. It's really only a kind of travail. Those around her, over and over, likened the airports to a hospital where people break down or through in extreme states of exhaustion or emotion. Time itself plays strange tricks around the airport as we routinely wake up in Tokyo today and arrive in LA last night. Everyone's looking at his watch in departure lounges, but all the watches show different times. People tap their fingers, stretch their legs, pace restlessly back and forth in terminals. They also run in them like O.J. Simpson in the Hertz commercial, hurdling obstacles and brushing past strangers who stare at them listlessly from their distant worlds. Airports are among the only places in our lives where we sometimes have to wait for six hours or eight or even ten, where we're actually paid off for waiting with free hotel rooms or offer $200 in cash if we'll voluntarily wait another three hours. <laughs> Events are bunched up weirdly, like the people suddenly primitive, pushing their way towards the counter, and time slips and stretches, as in the final 11 seconds of a basketball game, which takes 15 minutes to play out on TV. I think sometimes we become children again in airports, irresponsible and without stewardship, of course, as I was as a nine-year-old in Heathrow, but also spoilt and denied and restless and bemused all at once. One of the odd things about airports, like every other modern convenience, is that the instruments we make to serve us always hold us hostage. And many of the people in gate lounges are clearly frustrated because they're at the mercy of forces they can't understand or control. Red-eyed, bored, waiting to be transported. In our worst moments, in fact, it can seem as if the airport is an anthology of modern ills. We munch fast food in a transit lounge amidst the beeps of mortal combat machines and the anonymous props of a motel. The sleek shops and cold screens undermined somehow by the paper cups and sniffling noses, the sense of people at loose ends. Neil Labute's audaciously heartless independent movie in the company of men 
starts all too perfectly in a departure lounge in some nowhere international late at night. A land of fluorescent lights and empty hotels, garment bags and shoeless men in suits. The nighttime start of a journey into an amoral zone where we're not ourselves and so anything is possible. Airports can be vertiginous places because we have nothing to hold our identities in place there. The most fundamental things are up for grabs. Heathrow, writes John le Carre, referring to a Russian spy, is one of Chechev's favorite places. He can take rooms there by the half day. He can rotate hotels. He can fancy himself anonymous. Gander Airport in Newfoundland is famous for only one reason. as a place for, for, where for years people became someone else, as Cubans, briefly touching down for refueling, would race across the tarmac or hide in bushes, effectively saying, I'm no longer who I used to be. My new self starts today. One day, in Kyoto, staying at the Holiday Inn, I returned to LAX in a dream, and found myself taking the shuttle bus round and around, looking for a hotel in which to stay. The other people on the bus were all disheveled immigrants looking for a job and speaking not a word of English, and so all of us went round in circles, archetypal residents of that running in place that becomes part of the airport state of mind. Well, I... <clears throat> Thanks. Um, I barely survived that elaborate uh, exercise in self-torture and masochism. Uh, and then I decided to continue my traipsing around the world and my investigation of what a global lifestyle might be by visiting one of my oldest friends in the world. Um, he's actually my global twin in a way. We have the same birthday, we went to the same high school, then we ended up at the same college. This was in England. Uh, I came over to this country uh, to graduate school. He suddenly appeared at the same graduate school. Uh, I went all the way to Japan, perhaps to avoid him. Uh, he suddenly showed up in Tokyo as the head of his, uh, his uh, company's Japan office. And so we've had parallel identities in a way, again, that couldn't have been imagined uh, not so many years ago. Uh, and when I went to see my friend Richard, he was living in Hong Kong and, like most foreign businessmen in Hong Kong, was living in a hotel. Um, Hong Kong, as many of you know, is a kind of website of a city. I think of it almost as an international convenience store. And nobody comes from Hong Kong. Almost everyone who lives in Hong Kong is either an exile or an expat or a refugee. It conjugates the different ways of not belonging. Uh, the only language everyone speaks is a dollar. And until maybe five years ago, literally the only government there was a free market. Um, so Hong Kong has this very interesting aspect of servicing people who are from one place and on their way somewhere else and who stop off in this floating zone just for a moment. So it seemed apt that Richard was living in a hotel and I went to see him in, in his room there and I said, Richard, I've come all this way to, uh, to see you. When are you going to be free for dinner? So he looked at his calendar and he said, oh, you know, actually, I'm going to be in 13 different countries in the next 13 days. Um, and then he showed me his passport, because I was looking incredulous, and I counted 139 border crossings in the previous year, which is to say once every two days he'd been in a different country. And then he pulled out um, his briefcase and extracted from it 27 little cellophane bags. And in every one of those bags were the coins, uh, bus tickets, and phone cards he would need for the 27 countries in which he might find himself the following day. Richard would literally go every morning to the airport. Sometimes he'd fly around the world. Sometimes he'd shrug and come home. But I, very, I got the very distinct sense that at any given time, he didn't really know where he was. Uh, and I certainly knew that his wife didn't know where he was. Uh, <laughs> At one point, he said, well, actually, I think I will be home on Thursday. But the only way that she and I could begin to figure out what time he'd be home was by turning on uh, Channel 3 on the TV in, in their hotel room, where international airport arrivals were shown, and she tried to figure out whether he'd be coming back from Sydney or Calcutta. Uh, and of course, it's the nature of a trader or a merchant to go from place to place. There have been no nomads ever since there have been humans. People have always been moving, but I thought never uh, at such distances with such extraordinary speed. And I wondered what a marriage would mean in these circumstances. I wondered uh, how a family would have to be constructed differently for a family like this, both of whom, in fact, were management consultants. Um, Richard and, and Sharon, as they are, are actually extremely rooted people who have uh, deep down, no confusion about who they are or where they're going. But I thought for anyone who is less steady than they were, um, this kind of lifestyle would play havoc with the fundamental foundations, again, on which people build their lives. And I think my most sobering moment in the Hong Kong apartment came when finally Richard got back and the three of us were sitting around the table having uh, some, actually, room service, but <laughs> the closest we could get to a dinner. Um, and Richard's wife worked for the same company as he did, and he said that sometimes when the two of them were sitting 
sitting across a dinner table from one another, if he had something important to tell her, he would actually, as they sat in Hong Kong, ring up her voicemail in Boston and leave a message for her because he could more easily communicate uh, calling around the world than across the table to the person in front of him. Uh, so again, uh, that's an extreme case, not many people are living like that, but with each passing month, more and more people are, and more and more of the basic human activities, those still, uh, the, the, still those only of a small number, uh, are played out on this um, cosmic or, or global sta stage. And I think one of the interesting things to me about the present moment is that the very question that global individuals are addressing, which is to say how to make a peace between the different cultures inside themselves and how to steady themselves as the world spins around them at the speed of light, and how to make a new kind of self, are mirrored by the very same questions that are being asked by cities and communities. What individuals are addressing is exactly the same as um, what cultures face as both of them try to think about how to make a new multiculture of the heart. And so I decided to, at this point to go and look at two cities. Uh, as DJ said, <laughs> Toronto that's a paradise and Atlanta that's an inferno. Uh, it was rather evil of me to take these two extremes. But I wanted to see the best and worst case possibilities for, um, for a multiculturalism of, um, on a collective scale. And as most of you know, Toronto is the obvious place to choose if you want to see the, the better prospects for multiculturalism. Statistically, by official UN statistics, it's the most multicultural city in the world, and also statistically it's the safest city in North America. It's the best organized city in North America. It has the most vital literary culture of any city in the West. Uh, and so if you put those two facts together, it suggests on paper at least that a multiculture can go beyond the kind of cultures we know and that um, a multiculture can become something greater than the sum of its parts and can bring these disparate parts together and create a choir of sorts. Uh, and so I, I walked around uh, Toronto, where sometimes the multiculturalism can be a little too literal. As you walk down the street, you see the multicultural pizza joint, the multicultural you know, support committee, the multicultural baseball team, and so on. Uh, but the, the private reason why I was so drawn to, run, to Toronto was that, like many of you again, perhaps, I'm a, a great, voracious reader. And as I was sitting uh, here in Santa Barbara, every few months a novel would arrive on my doorstep, and it'd be a radical, unprecedented, beautiful novel, quite unlike any novel I'd read before. And so I'd flip excitedly to the back to find out more about the author, and in almost every case, the author was living in Toronto. Uh, as you know, Canadian literature is enjoying a great resurgence at the moment, and that's mostly because it's written by people from Bombay and Sri Lanka and Tanzania and Barbados in Eastern Europe. Uh, and there's a reason for this, I think, which is that people from all four corners of the world assemble in Toronto, they look around them, they see people from the other three corners, and inevitably, willy-nilly, whether they mean to or not, they have to address the issue, how do you make a community out of strangers, and how do you try to draw cultures together and, and make something positive out of them. And so, more and more novels, uh, from Anne Michaels' Fugitive Pieces to Michael Ondaatje's English Patients, literally um, and imaginatively try to imagine new notions of community, new ways of defining a social order in ways that uh, the likes of Thackeray or Fielding or Jane Austen uh, could, could never have, have dreamed. Uh, the most obvious example, as I say, is The English Patient, where, as many of you remember, The English Patient isn't English and almost dies because of that. The person fighting for the British Army isn't British, he's Indian and he's a Sikh to boot. The character called Caravaggio is in fact a foreigner in the Italy where they find themselves. And the son around whom these three characters turn, Hannah, has a name that could be Czech or Japanese or, or even, dare I say it, Canadian. And during World War II, at precisely the time when the world is completely convulsed by nationalistic divisions and people are being killed because of the passports they carry or the religions that they hold inside themselves, these four characters step outside the old forms into what Aldachi calls an oasis society and try to create uh, a, new, a new kind of society, regardless of, of creed and clothes and color and custom, uh, in the desert, where no lines and divisions are visible in the sand. They try to imagine how, in the empty space, you can create something new. So Toronto um, gives me a very hopeful sense, though I should say parenthetically, two weeks ago, I went to Toronto to tell them what a wonderful city they, were, they have, and almost the whole of Toronto rose up as one to tell me I was a fool and to tell me that I didn't know enough about the harsh realities of their city, and I'm sure there's some truth in that, but 
compared with the other places I see, it, it represents a, at least a, a, a placid and harmonious seeming response to some of these issues. And wickedly, as mentioned, I contrasted that with Atlanta. And Atlanta is a natural place to consider in this context because on paper, again, it's an enormous global player. It's a home to CNN and to Coca-Cola, to UPS, to Holiday Inn, to Delta Airlines. Uh, if you look in terms or think in terms of balance sheets, it's really one of the major players in the global universe. And yet I, at least, when I was walking around Atlanta, felt I was in one of the least international, least cosmopolitan places I'd ever been, and a place that was rooted in the black and white divisions in every sense of 150 years ago. And certainly, when you stand outside Martin Luther King's birthplace on Auburn Avenue and you hear those ringing sentences about universal brotherhood and the harmony of man and all that joins us beneath the surface, you only have to look 10 minutes down the street by foot just um, half a mile or less, and you see the gleaming towers and convention centers of modern Atlanta, 72-story hotels, the flagship of the Ritz-Carlton. It's all 10 minutes away, and yet right outside Martin Luther King's birthplace is one of the most shattered neighborhoods I've ever seen. The, the windows are all broken, the, the stores are boarded up, people are wandering dazed down the middle of the street. They're 10 minutes walk away from the 22nd century, and yet they seem to be in the 2nd century or further back. Uh, and in some ways that seems to me a model of the globe, uh, which is to say a few shiny high rises protruding into the future and surrounded uh, at some level by, by wilderness and people poorer than ever before. When I was in Atlanta, 43% of, of the kids in Atlanta lived at an absolute poverty level. And that was in the face of um, these giant corporations. I also was interested to go to Atlanta because a large part of this book is about the Olympic Games, and the Olympic Village in some ways represents perhaps a platonic model of the global village. I think it speaks to some of our sweeter dreams about people, how people can come together and forget their differences. And the Olympics itself is constructed on that model because, as you know, in the opening ceremonies, everybody, everybody walks out regimented in their national colors and their national ranks, and in the closing ceremonies, everybody spills onto the central lawn and the colors run. You can't tell where anyone comes from. Uh, at the same time, the Olympics are a, a curious phenomenon because if they insist upon national divisions at the same time that more and more people are putting them behind them, that nation states seem ever more ir irrelevant. The, the Olympics is about waving the flag at a time when the logo seems perhaps to dominate more people's lives. I was in Barcelona in 1992 at that archetypal moment when Michael Jordan literally said that he wasn't going to stand before the Star Spangled Banner if he wasn't allowed to wear his Nikes. Uh, and it was a way of his saying his allegiance was first and foremost to the company rather than to the country. And it was a way of underlining the sense that more and more people have, which is that the new nations are actually the large corporations. And the Olympics is often caught on those divisions. I remember in Atlanta in 1996, um, the Canadian 4x100 male sprinting team was extremely formidable, and that, again, was because none of them had been born in Canada. Um, they were all from the West Indies, and they were all up against the West Indians who were representing Britain, France, and, <laughs> and more naturally, Trinidad. Um, the greatest Kenyan ru runner in the world couldn't come to those Olympics because he was busy becoming a Dane. Uh, and so the Olympics in some ways speaks again to the two levels of globalism as I see it. On the one hand it speaks to the globalism we associate with the Dalai Lama and Vaclav Havel and, and Dr. King and uh, reminding us of universalism and, and of um, what links us more than it tears us apart. At the same time globalism in the Olympics is usually a matter of the 11 huge multinational sponsors uh, who construct globalism in a much less enlightening and, and liberating way. And finally, having gone through these two cities, I returned to England, the place where I was born, and Japan, uh, the country where I choose to live. And as you can probably tell from all that I've been babbling about, um, my book really has two themes. One is how do we begin to situate, situate ourselves in the midst of foreigners? How do we come to understand or at least dissolve divisions between us and all the people down the street who look and think and feel very different from us? Uh, and my extremely eccentric answer is to go to Japan. Any of you who've been there know that on the surface level, it's the most alien country you could ever visit. Uh, it's like being on another planet. Everything goes the other way around. Literally, when you arrive, the baggage carousels go the other way around. The light switches turn in a different way. The Japanese, as we see it, read their books from right to left and back to front. Um, so on a surface level, it's utterly, couldn't be further removed from the places I know. And yet at a deeper level, um, it makes 
absolute sense to me. It reminds me of the England where I was brought up. I respect and feel I can learn from its values, assumptions, priorities. Japan hasn't prepared itself very much for a multicultural society and is going to have to address that in, in the coming years if it's going to remain a global player. But at the same time, the divisions are still very strong there and there's a kind of comfort in that. They haven't uh, committed themselves to, to um, complete drift there. And so writing about Japan here is a way of my saying, my feeling that uh, all of us live amidst foreignness and the important question is at what level the foreignness takes place and how we can find um, a home in the fundamental sense even in the most alien place. The other theme of this book, as you can probably tell, uh, is my sense, and I'm sure many of you have felt this, that the world's getting more and more accelerated and fragmented, that this junction is a part of more and more lives, and that we're awash in a sea of data and choices and opportunities. Uh, I recently found out that 20,000 sites on the World Wide Web are devoted just to the theme of information overload. And I think a lot of us <laughs> a lot of us have this sensation, even if we don't travel, of being spun round and round and round till we, we, we've lost all our sense of orientation. Even Marshall McLuhan, who in some ways is a patron saint of the electronic cottage, said you get going very fast and you lose a sense of where you'll end up. Um, and so my sense is that the one good thing to be said about the acceleration and the intensification of data and the, the fracturing that I describe in this book is that perhaps it quickens a hunger for the opposite. It quickens a hunger for silence and for stillness and for space, for slowness. And more and more people I know are actually consciously, obje conscientiously objecting to the world and trying to find ways to step out so as to anchor themselves or to connect themselves with, with something more ancestral or ancient perhaps. More and more people are retreating to monasteries or taking long trips into the wilderness or uh, just uh, trying to find ways, unplugging the phone and trying to find ways uh, in which they can make sure that their identity is not running away from them. So I'll just end now with a two-minute reading about my life in Japan and the only introduction I need to give is that um, the place that really moves me there is Kyoto and for that reason I live a little way away from Kyoto so that I can keep uh, the sense of wonder alive. <clears throat> The homes we choose, in short, deserve a tolerance we might not extend to the homes we inherit. And in a world where we have to work hard to gain a sense of home, we have to exert ourselves just as much to sustain a sense of other. I choose, therefore, to live some distance from the eastern hills of Kyoto, which move me like memories of a life I didn't know I had. To visit the city of temples from my, where I live involves a 90-minute pilgrimage by bus and train and second train and then another train so that every trip has an air of ceremony and anticipation. Thus, Kyoto is unclouded for me by the routines of paying bills and cleaning clothes. And coming to it from a suburb of white ascot cars and coffee shops called Clever, I still catch my breath when I see the lanterns and the autumn temples leading up into the bamboo forest as into another life or hear the temple bells ringing along the philosopher's path at dusk. Once every six months or so, I take my girlfriend back to her hometown, and for six hours we rent a car and drive deep into the countryside. The very novelty of motion in a space of our own with a tape deck of our own is itself a small enchantment, and Kyoto swings open often like a heavy gate admitting us to a deeper ancestral quiet. One cold winter night, we went there to celebrate a ninth anniversary of sorts, and awakening in the dark saw the year's first snow coming down to cover the old spires and the few wooden buildings remaining in the centre of town. Going out into the freshened chill, still hushed and smoky in the early morning, we rented a car and drove it up into the northeast, traditional area of demons and therefore monasteries, towards Mount Hiei. As we left the town behind and began climbing the narrow, winding roads of the old mountain, we found ourselves in a festival of silver. The first car admitted up the mountain since the snowfall, and the only car in sight in a world of silence and whiteness for as far as we could see. Everything was newly minted, virginal in the fresh snow, and the pines were still coated with a sugar lining against the sky now wide awake and blue. We drove up and up into a wonderland of sorts, with nothing around but green trees and white, chunks of snow falling from their branches, and everywhere a newborn hush. The large parking lots with their vending machines stood empty. The occasional tall red Tory gates were fringed with white. We moved along the road in a suspended state of wonder, through a soundless trail that cut high into the dark mountain. 
Stopping at last, we got out in a silent landscape of huge trees and silver everywhere. The sky was blue and the day was windless. There was no sound anywhere, nothing but dark trees, white lacing, stone Buddhas fringed with snow. A, stone slope, a steep slope led up to a temple, hidden away in a grove like a secret pendant against a heart. Outside Shakado, we sat on a wooden platform while a gong sounded within, and a man prepared the day's austerities in front of a large Buddha. My stockinged feet were cold on the wooden steps, and as far as I could see across the valley, there were just ranks of pines in whitened rows. Then, briefly, four young monks in blue work clothes tramping into the forest, headbands white against their shaven scalps, and the silence, and the whiteness, and the calm. We sat for a while in the secret sanctuary, quiet on this quiet day. Then we drove back into the high rises and belching trucks, the maddened pachinko parlors of the ancient capital. Thank you so much for listening so patiently. <clears throat> um, Thank you. Um, I believe there's a mic here, and um, there's more than enough time for questions. So if any of you have questions, please just come up and, uh, and, and ask them right here. I'm going to have to question myself. <laughs> yep. I'd first like to start by just thanking you, Pico, for taking the time to spend the evening with us. We're extremely grateful to you. I just want to do a quick housekeeping. Um, we'll take six questions tonight, and then Pico has very kindly agreed to sign books in the back of the auditorium. And uh, so that we can handle the number of people who I'm sure will want their books signed, we'll have a line come down on this ramp here. And again, we'll take six questions tonight. I've never done this before, so I feel... <laughs> Um, I love to read travel books, and when I discovered Video Night in Kathmandu, I thought I'd died and gone to heaven. And I, I thought maybe you like travel books as well as writing them, and if you do, uh, do you have any favorite other writers who write about um, their experiences in odd parts of the world and how they react to them? Uh, I think I've never managed to solve the conundrum of why the best travel writers in the world um, are still the English people, and the only explanation I give is as those schools from 1441 I mentioned before, where the food is so horrible and the conditions are so spartan that when you find yourself in darkest Afghanistan with nothing to eat but stones, you're actually used to it, or it's a step up from what you grew up with. Uh, and so in terms of travel writers, I think um, I like all the traditional classics. I think Jan Morris has as good an eye for places as anyone in the world and writes an imperial prose that you won't see anymore. That I think she's the last voice uh, of the British Empire. And, uh, and sadly, that kind of rolling, mellifluous, adjective-filled prose is increasingly a thing of the past, especially because of fragmentation, acceleration, and MTV. Uh, I like, in, in a similar way, and this is more provocative, and many of you will get up and roar, perhaps, uh, P.J. O'Rourke, who I think has as keen a, a sense of the world and as good a heart in terms of responding to the world as any American travel writer. I know I'm not interested in his politics, I don't find him funny, but I do think he's one of the best recorders uh, of places that I visit, and time after time I'll go to uh, to South Africa or El Salvador or Haiti or the Philippines and come back with some brilliant observation and I'll open PJ O'Rourke and he's got it there except ten times more brilliant. Uh, I like some of the old-fashioned uh, British writers like Norman Lewis and Colin Thubron and I like Paul Theroux for in sense undertaking the most fearless adventure of all which is the travel journey into the interior and in those books of his which dance along the line between fiction and non-fiction I'm thinking especially of my other life and my secret history packages as fiction but feeling like nonfiction, he dares to take himself to task and to ask the most um, unsettling questions of himself with a courage that I think is, is bracing. And he understands that the whole notion of traveling around the world is about traveling into the parts of yourself that you'd rather not look at. Um, for me, as I think for most people, 
the, the best travel books are the ones that undertake at once a parallel adventure, um, both the physical and the spiritual. So a book like Peter Matheson's Snow Leopard moves me because partly he's going across the uncharted terrain of the Himalayas, but more deeply he's going into an investigation of Buddhism and more deeply still into all the questions that arose in him when his wife had died a year earlier. And so when you go into the Himalayas with Peter Matheson, you feel as if you're going into the fundamental questions that any life should address. And in the same way, even something like Oliver Sacks' Island of the Colorblind, <coughs> where he's not just going to an exotic place, but he's literally going to a place where people, because of their physiological conditions, see the world in different colors from the rest of us. And that, to me, is, is what traveling is meant to be about. Um, the two other things that I'd say in this context, and Roman's going to wish he'd never given time for six questions because I'm giving a very long answer, <laughs> is, is that first, uh, the, for me, this whole notion of travel, or the genre of travel, has been revolutionized because now you can just walk down a street in Los Angeles and see so much exoticism that I think the interesting travel of the next few years would be people just visiting their own neighborhoods and seeing how they're being transformed. Uh, and my favorite travel writers are actually Emerson and Thoreau. Emerson, who says traveling is a fool's paradise, and Thoreau, who says I've traveled widely and conquered. Um, they both were trying to remind us that travel can happen when you fall in love, or when you get held up, or indeed when your house gets burnt down. Um. Hmm. Microphone's looking empty. Somebody, I think so. I can't actually see into the audience, but I think somebody is bravely coming forward. Good evening. Hello. Uh, delighted to enjoy all that you had to say. Uh, you and I have talked before, and it had to do with that video night in Kathmandu. Uh, I was about to lead a group of students to Nepal for a semester program, and I was asking you about uh, updated books to use with that group. We never discovered quite what was right for that, but that didn't matter. Uh, the conversation led to so many ways of rethinking the approach to learning about uh, how culture impacts the visitor and the visitor impacting the culture, uh, that it was a, a fascinating experience. Uh, the best thing was that I was able to take that group of students uh, to one of the little pubs in the back streets of Kathmandu where they had the videos and got them to watch uh, Monty Python's The Meaning of Life. <laughs> uh, and of course the, the big question was how did these Nepalis who were watching this film and watching these visitors from the modern world watching this film what happened to their minds? How are they being impacted? And I just wonder, you know, from all of your travel and all of your reading, writing, and thinking about this, what is the role of the longer-term traveler, the low-budget traveler who gets inside one of these cultures in modifying the local people's way of viewing the world? Yes, I, that's almost a, a two-part question, and, and to answer the first one first, I absolutely agree with you, which is I think that every culture takes uh, something from Hollywood, say, and turns it into something else that's not quite Napoleon, not quite American. I never worry about the world getting homogeneous culturally, because, uh, as I might say glibly, every cult culture sings Madonna in a different accent. And Madonna means something very different in Iraq from what she means in China, from what she means in Los Angeles. Uh, to take uh, um, an example recently, all the world, as far as I could see, was watching The Sixth Sense. But in certain places, the most terrifying thing about The Sixth Sense was the notion of a single mother. They just didn't have that in their cultures. Uh, in Japan, where I saw it, a psychologist was much more scary than a ghost. Uh, they don't have psychology. <laughs> At least a few years ago, there were only eight psychologists in Tokyo, but there are a lot of ghosts there, and a ghost is, is, uh, is a much more common thing to them. Uh, here in California, people were just stunned to see that Bruce Willis could act. So. <laughs> Every, everyone was, was facing the same images, but each of them translated it into their own language. And so I never would worry that, uh, that 
the sixth sense would, would uh, corrupt any culture. And I think sometimes we have a double standard because here in Santa Barbara, for example, we devour movies from China and Nepal and Ethiopia and Mongolia and never really feel less American than we were at the start of the evening. We just feel that we've been admitted to a different culture and a different way of seeing things. And I think if we are unchanged by the cultural artifacts we take in, people on the far side of the world, especially in, in Asia, say, are ten times less susceptible to being changed. They live in old and deep and ancient cultures um, where if the the roots are strong enough, I don't think they're going to be transformed by the latest visitation of Bruce Springsteen or even St Sylvester Stallone. Uh, so I think there's a kind of Darwis Darwinian sifting, but I've always been optimistic about the ability of uh, places like Nepal or most of the third world countries I visit to withstand that. At the same time, in terms of the individual's obligation, I think one question you're asking is that many of us delight in finding a, a hidden paradise, and then we have to face the question of whether we should tell our friends about it and make it an unhidden ex-paradise. And uh, my sense is that though we all know about the, the dangers and destruction that tourism could bring, and we think not enough about the, the, the wonders and opportunities it can bring. And I feel that tourists are the eyes and ears of people in impoverished and closed parts of the world, and actually we can do um, a great amount of good. And that any of you who have traveled, and I'm sure you asking the question, know from your own travels, that especially when you go to a closed country, when you go to a Burma or Cuba or Tibet, all they really want is to meet somebody from America. They've, they've seen America stigmatized by their government, they've dreamed of America covertly in their videos, but they, have, they feel they have little contact with America, the reality. And an American in Vietnam or Cuba or countries that are ostensibly our enemies gets a warmer welcome than almost anyone. And Part, and I think that the best thing we can bring to people who are sealed off from the world is just partly information, partly a sense of reality, partly a sense of all the things that are going on to which they don't have access, and mostly perhaps an imaginative escape and an open window. And I think for somebody who's stuck in Burma, for example, and who's almost literally under house arrest, one of the few things that can give him hope is if somebody in Santa Barbara sends him a letter, or at least even if somebody in Santa Barbara is thinking about him or has his address. And he's made this contact with a person on the far side of the world, and somehow his world may seem a little le less limited to him. And, and a tourist can also bring, back, bring to the person in Burma or Cuba a sense of what uh, Cuba and Burma has to offer. People, uh, as in Toronto, as I mentioned, have a very keen sense of the things that are going wrong in their communities, and perhaps a less keen sense of what's wondrous to the outsider. And I think that's a way in which an outsider can import hope to a community, import his own fresh eyes. So when people wonder even about the, the, the political rightness of going to a Burma or a Tibet, where all your money is actually going to the, to the government that's oppressing the people, I still feel that the best thing an individual can do is try to help the person on an individual level. We probably don't have time for six questions, but we may have time for, for one more. You talk um, lovingly and longingly about your experience in Kyoto, and the recent articles about you talk about your experience or your desire to go off to a monastery probably four times a year, they say. What are you looking for and what are you learning? Oh, thank you. What a, what a um, deep and searching question. You've been doing your research, I think. Um, and as you probably know, uh, when I first went to Japan 13 years ago, I went in high hopes of spending a year in a Zen temple. I went there, uh, quickly found it was much harder work than I expected. Uh, when I was sitting in Santa Barbara, I imagined a Zen temple was haiku and rock gardens and beautiful woodcuts and uh, that the images of Hiroshige and Kawabata brought into a beautiful fusion. When I got there, I found it was cooking and getting up at dawn and scrubbing the, um, the floors. So, so I left after a week and told myself I could learn more about Buddhism by seeing how it suffuses a culture. And Japan. Most Japanese people I know might not be steeped in the sutras or the, or the texts of traditional Buddhism, but Buddhism so influences every uh, aspect of that society that really I did feel that just seeing how they naturally put somebody else's in, uh, needs before their own, just seeing the consideration and courtesy and the natural egolessness of the place, I felt that, that I learned a lot of things that um, threw into question what I'd uh, grown up with in, in England and America. I do now indeed uh, spend uh, as much time as I can in a Catholic hermitage up the coast. It's like any Zen parable. You go all the way around the world to find a temple and then there's one just three hours drive away from your house. Uh, and I suppose the reason I go there is uh, for silence, for purity, 
Uh, on, for days on end, there's nothing but the sound of tolling bells. For as far as I can see, there's nothing but the great wide expanse of the ocean looking out onto the Pacific. Um, as I walk up the slope, I feel like I'm walking through avenues of light. There's just flying mustard and poppies, especially in the spring. Uh, and it's amazing what a positive, active silence can bring into your lives. I, I live, as you can tell, in this very quiet house up in the hills in Santa Barbara. And to look at it, you'd think that's as great a retreat or sanctuary as, um, as any place you could find. But as long as the phone's there, and as long as my friend's here, and as long as there are the distractions of movies to be seen here, um, and lectures to attend at the arts and lectures, uh, somehow I'm, I'm rooted in the habits of my normal self. And for me, the whole point of travel is to leave yourself behind to leave your assumptions behind, to become cleared out, and to step into another person. And so just uh, the fact of going to a place where there are no telephones, no television, uh, and although silence isn't mandated, since it's the reason most of the people go there, it's largely observed, one day uh, in, in such a place uh, feels like a year. Um, you can see more stars than you'd ever see elsewhere. And I find that if I just go away for three days, uh, I'm not only reminded of depths, uh, that this whole book is about the, the clash between multiculturalism on the surface and what is going on underneath. You're not only reacquainted with depths and with something ancient and with a place where nature still seems the main protagonist and human beings seem very small indeed, uh, but you're acquainted with uh, what happens when everything else falls away. And in silence, uh, there, there's nothing to divert you, and um, you, you go deeper into your life than um, ever you would otherwise. And I find that questions I didn't know I had answer themselves. Uh, and I go there often um, in a state of distraction and agitation. And I come back after even two days knowing exactly what I should do with my life, and feeling that if only for that temporary time, uh, I've been reminded of what my priorities are. And I come back feeling directed and, and reminded, at least, of um, what is deepest in us and, and what is most on the surface. So again, thank you very much for waiting um, and listening, and I will be at the back of the room.